Stanford University. And it's a great pleasure to be here today. Um, I've commuted perhaps uh, the farthest uh, from Santiago, Chile, uh, to attend our, our uh, uh, forum today. And it's um, a, a double pleasure uh, to be talking about um, the EVP project after having heard all of the wonderful uh, collaborative efforts that uh, we've been uh, apprised of uh, so far today. And it's a little bit intimidating um, to, to come at the end of so many wonderful presentations. And on top of that, to be at a stage in our research that is very much uh, towards the beginning, uh, maybe shading towards the middle, but definitely not uh, anywhere near the end of our, of our research project. Um, so what we're looking at is the salmon industry, the farm salmon industry in Chile. And in particular, we're looking at it in a regional context. So what is happening within the region where the salmon industry is most heavily concentrated? What is happening there in terms of the environment, in terms of people's perceptions of the environment, and in terms of the social and, and economic transformations of that community by uh, the salmon industry's uh, presence. So as you can see, we're, we're looking at a study region here that's in southern Chile. And it's on the island and a series of small islands surrounding this main island of Chiloé. Has anyone here been to uh, Chiloé out of curiosity, a few of you? Oh, wonderful. Um, so you can attest that it's a really beautiful um, study site, which I'm delighted um, to, be, to be studying under the auspices of, of the Venture uh, EVP project. Um, so what I wanted to do in the limited time that I have is to focus on a couple of our preliminary research questions to kind of walk through a little bit of our research strategy. What have we done thus far? And in the process of doing that, I think it'll highlight the ways in which um, different members of our team, which is a very diverse and large team, uh, have collaborated together. And I guess, kind of in a way, try to end um, today's series of presentations on a similar note of emphasizing the value of that collaborative project and, and process um, in this particular case. So we're looking at things as, as uh, diverse as income effects or kind of economic um, variation that might be traced to the salmon industry. But we're also interested in things like perception, the way that environmental change um, might be perceived by people from different um, social or economic positions. So it's easy to see how in answering these different kinds of questions, you're going to need to draw on very different forms of um, expertise and different perspectives that we're able to bring together under the auspices of, of the project. Here's the study area again. Um, it's an island, oops, about, um, about 100 uh, miles long and 25 miles wide. It's the second largest island in South America. And most of the salmon production is in this region. So our study area focuses here. Um, farm salmon is, of course, um, a new industry in Chile, in southern Chile. There was no uh, salmon production at all in Chile prior to the 1970s. And farm salmon really became a major export in the 1990s. And so you can just see that the production in terms of the amount of, of salmon uh, uh, shot up dramatically. And um, participation, labor force participation from our sample. So this bottom graph is just showing number of people in our sample uh, who got into the salmon industry also goes up um, quite, quite dramatically. Now, there's been some major problems with all of this rampant growth and development in the salmon industry. These problems have uh, culminated in a terrible environmental uh, disaster, uh, infectious salmon anemia, or ESA, which wiped out a good amount of the Atlantic salmon um, population that was being farmed in the region, and that made up the, the lion's share of, of the salmon that was being produced in, in Chile in 2008. So there's a current ecological and environmental crisis, which obviously has as well um, 
social and economic effects, right? So we can see that there's an interaction between the environment and ecology and um, economic and social experiences in this region. And we're interested in both and kind of bringing them together. Uh, this is what a, a salmon uh, a pin looks like. Um, this is, uh, so let me talk just now briefly about how we organize our team. So we, we joined together to develop this EVB project um, with the intention of bringing together expertise on the biology, economics, history, and uh, kind of sociology of this region. And so we brought together, for example, um, Roz Naylor, um, Hal Mooney, um, Richard White from history, uh, a colleague of mine from history, um, Meg Caldwell from the law school. And we also have a wonderful um, uh, research uh, uh, associate and graduate student, Andy Gerhardt, who's a part of the E-IPER program. And many of the previous presentations today emphasize the importance of having really great students um, participating in these projects. And in a, in a way, having the students as, as really the, the center piece, the, the pivot point around which we can um, gravitate and get together and um, really gives us uh, a, a, um, the, the kind of glue, the, 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 the source of cohesion of these teams. Because in a sense, it's a real challenge to bring together um, such a diverse um, kind of, uh, of group of academics um, on, on a kind of new project like this. We also relied in our work, as many of the other EVP projects relied, on um, assistance from groups in the field. So in this case, uh, the organization uh, RIMISPI, uh, which is a um, research uh, economic and Social Research Organization, Center for Latin American Rural Development, uh, which is located in Santiago, uh, Chile. And so working together with investigators from RIMISP, we were able to put together our survey. Our, we had a very large uh, randomized survey of households throughout the study region. The survey um, identified households in both rural and urban districts, and then um, we administered a very uh, comprehensive survey. So like some others, I have my prop. And if you could um, come up here and, and see it, you would, you would see that there are um, over 175 different questions in our survey. It's quite a, a remarkable uh, document. I'm a little bit shocked that people uh, were willing to spend the hour that it took to um, fill out this survey, but we have an incredible amount of survey data. We took that survey data and worked together with colleagues here at Stanford in the Spatial History Lab um, to locate our households in a geographical space. And um, by locating specific households to specific locations in uh, XY coordinates, we're able to then um, develop some preliminary maps and preliminary analysis of the arrival and spread of the salmon industry in terms of participation of households as workers in the salmon industry. Um, so using um, this kind of preliminary information, we're hoping, and this is, again, I want to emphasize that our project, we just got our survey results about a month ago. So I, I'm here reporting the very first results that we've been able to extract from that process. Um, but what we saw was that the salmon industry, even though it really only boomed in the 1990s, and really the second half of the 1990s, that the industry was present to a certain extent in many parts of our study area from very early on. Um, and that it was a kind of gradual um, filling in and expansion of the industry throughout the study region. So it didn't start in one point and then start and then emanate throughout the region. But it rather, it arrived kind of all over the place at once. And I think that this matters. It's going to change the way that people perceive the effects of the salmon industry on their communities. It's going to change their sense of where 
the industry comes from. So it's not, it, one of the things that we asked about in our survey that I think is going to turn out to be really interesting is do you know where your boss is from and where your boss lives? Do you know where the company that you work for is located? Or even do you know where the products that are being produced uh, in your operations go? And we have these questions about spatial understandings of the place of the community or the individual and their in the context of this industry. But one of the things that uh, immediately began, began to become apparent to us was that people had a much more thoroughgoing and sophisticated understanding of this global industry than we, you know, Stanford uh, EVP researchers uh, tended to think from the outset. We thought, well, they're, you know, they're probably going to have limited information or distorted information but it doesn't quite turn out to be the case. And I think in part it's because of this long exposure and, and general exposure to the industry um, uh, throughout the region. Okay, now things that I'm interested in, things that, that Roz uh, is, is, I think, interested in as well, have to do with well, what are the economic and social effects of uh, major um, uh, expansion of something like the salmon industry on the community and how do those play off against environmental and cultural effects? Um, so we're interested in, in both sides of this equation. But one thing we could ask is, just from the start, you know, is salmon, in, is salmon as an industry, is it good for uh, workers? Does it raise incomes? Or uh, conversely, does it contribute to even greater levels of inequality in, in uh, this part of Chile? Um, and so we're starting, this, we're only at the very beginning of this process, but we're starting to map um, the distribution of incomes to try to see whether um, there are clusters of, of, of uh, incomes above or below what we would, uh, the, the mean, um, whether people with high incomes and low incomes live together in the same communities or whether they live separately in different communities. And that, that could have a very profound effect on the way that the industry would be perceived or the way that we might talk about inequality? Is it something that's segmented and, and divides people very clearly into different communities? Or is it something that's experienced together? So it's not that it's not, there's inequality in both cases, but it, it could make a big difference um, how people are, are distributed. Um, and so again, apologies for uh, the kind of half-baked um, uh, data at this point, but this is uh, literally a couple of weeks into uh, crunching through the, the, the survey. But I wanted to share with you all um, some of our preliminary results that I think are kind of uh, a little bit odd or unexpected. And one was I thought that the salmon industry uh, would have a really big and clear um, positive effect on people's incomes. I thought that people who are in the salmon industry should have much higher incomes than people who aren't in the salmon industry. Well, in general, households that are in the salmon in industry do not seem to have significantly higher uh, incomes than people who are not in the salmon industry. Um, but there's a lot more dispersion uh, with the non-salmon uh, uh, population. So obviously, we're going to need to uh, run some more uh, analysis, um, some more careful statistical uh, tests to see what's going on there. Um, on the other side, households that don't engage in salmon uh, wage labor seem to have much higher levels of um, productive assets. So there could be a trade-off. There are households that have productive assets that don't need to work in the salmon industry. They have land, they have animals, they have something else that they can be doing, so they don't want to work in the salmon industry. And then there's a separate group of people who need to work in the salmon industry because they don't have uh, those resources. Um, so maybe it's not exactly this trade-off that we initially thought between just making more money in the salmon industry, but dealing with the slings and arrows of, of being out in the, in, the, in the water and dealing with the difficulty of the working conditions, but might be uh, something more than that. Um, so we ran a couple just uh, preliminary regressions to try to get at this more, more systematically and find that working in salmon has no uh, significant effect on your income um, if you're thinking about just total net income, including income from sales of agricultural products from non-wage uh, sources, 
but for wage income, uh, working in the salmon industry is very uh, significant and has very large effect. Um, so essentially in the wage economy, the salmon industry has really transformed life in, in Chiloé. And so the next step on that side of our research is going to be to look at the kind of social and cultural ramifications of that transformation. To see, okay, if households prior to the salmon industry did not have access to these kind of um, high uh, money wages, what difference does that make in terms of the shape that their household might have taken, the kinds of goods that were in their household, and their kind of cultural coordinates, the way that they perceive their, their place in, in the society. Um, and it's easy to think of a lot of ways that having access to wages would really transform um, people's households. If a younger person could leave home, get a job in the salmon industry, and start their own household, um, which might not have been possible in a previous uh, setup, where they might have had to stay at home where their father owned land and they were able to work on that land. So there could be some very profound um, social and cultural transformations that would be associated with access to this, this kind of income. Um, okay, finally, just to wrap up, I know I'm, I'm out of time. Um, we're also interested in looking at the way that different groups of people within this community perceive um, the, the environment around them. And it's obviously we're motivated by the idea that it's, it seems likely that people noticed that the salmon industry got really, really big, really fast. And all of a sudden, there are all these ships, and there are all these trucks, and there's all this stuff going into the water. Things are changing. How is that being perceived by people in the community? And do people who are in the salmon industry perceive the environmental changes differently from people who are, have no uh, direct involvement? So we're starting the process of, of, of thinking about these questions and mapping it out. And just to give you a little flavor of the kind of information we have in our survey, um, here you have perceptions of marine resource quality. Is it better than before or worse than before? Um, that is after the arrival of the salmon industry. And interestingly, from, from my perspective, it seems like there's not much of a difference whether you are involved in the salmon industry or not. Most people think that things are much worse um, uh, than before. So we're going to be exploring uh, in much greater detail the kind of correlations between these environmental perceptions, beliefs about the environment, and household structures, household composition, and degree of involvement in the salmon industry. Oddly enough, perceptions of water quality um, are very, very different um, than, than perceptions of marine resources. There's a lot more of a sense that water quality is better. And to be honest, I think this is an artifact of problematic wording in our survey because I think some the surveyors probably said, is water quality better or worse than 20 years ago? And most people said, well, now I have you know a, a pipe that brings water to my house, so water quality is much better. Um, so they're not necessarily talking about the water quality that you know we think that they they were talking about. So we you live and learn when you when you conduct these kind of surveys. Um, so phase two, just to conclude, our plan uh, in the future is to conduct oral histories. Andy Gerhardt, the EI per uh, graduate student, is in the field right now as I speak, and he'll be down in Chiloé conducting uh, these oral histories to get a clear idea of. The, the detailed stories uh, behind people's environmental perceptions or the ways in which the industry has transformed their, their communities. Um, we're also going to uh, continue to work with our survey data to expand uh, our analysis. Again, we're only at the very beginning. I, we have 175 odd questions in the survey, 11 different modules. So we've got an enormous amount of data to plow through. Um, but just wanted to give a little bit of the flavor of what we're, we're up to. Um, we're also interested in looking more at the science and the, the biology side. I'm an historian. It would be absurd for me to stand up here uh, right now and give you all a lecture on infectious salmon, anemia, or antibiotics um, in the water. But I will say um, that this is a, a major question that we're interested in. How do... 
um, the, how does this massive amount of antibiotics that's been dumped into the water affect the marine environment and that ecology, but also how does it, if, in, it might potentially affect human uh, uh, well-being as well. Um, so we're, go we're going to be looking at that. And like many of the other uh, presenters, we like to show pictures of our teams, of our groups, smiling, uh, working together uh, in the field. It was a great hardship to go down to Chiloé not too long ago and um, with Roz and, and David Battisti from University of Washington and Andy Gerhardt. Um, really, um, it, the best part about this whole process, from, from my perspective, uh, just to echo something that Sarah said um, in, in a previous presentation, um, is the ability to go to these collaborative meetings and know that I don't know nearly as much as I'd like to know, and, not, and to be comfortable with that, and to, to be learning and contributing to something um, with that kind of open mind and, and sense of exploration. And the thing that's been great from my perspective is that scientists and social scientists uh, thus far in my interaction with them through the EVP have been incredibly generous with their uh, with their willingness to explain these processes or explain these concepts, but also they've been remarkably open to um, learning something, I think, from uh, humanists and historians um, in these groups. So thank you all very much. So we have time for a quick question. One question. All the way from Chile, so you got to get one question. Uh, I was wondering when you did sampling on the households, did you break it down to so, like who in the household you were talking to or how it was especially infected? Yeah, the, the method was to try to talk to the head of the household, however, that was defined by the household itself. Um, but we noted um, the person's position in the household, so if we interviewed somebody who identified themselves as not the head of the household, but the spouse of the head of the household, for example, um, that was noted. And the survey took information on the specific ho the household level information, but also information on all of the members of that household, of course, provided by that, the one person that, that was being surveyed. Yeah. So remember, there's lots of times to talk to the speakers during the reception. So we're gonna take a three minute break. Thank you to Frank. Okay. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.